Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for that uh, powerful and evocative imagery as well. Uh, I appreciate each of you being here. Appreciate your your expert judgment. I think all of us here agreed that America should lead the world in space exploration. We have done so for decades. Um, but but I would like to start by just asking the panel, how good a job are we doing today? leading the world in space exploration, and how could we do better? We're not really leading the world. We have if you would hit your, hit your microphone, please. We have Sorry. a facility uh, up in space, and we've invested a lot in it, and we've gone to it, put it together, gone to it uh, for quite a while, and uh, then we changed our spacecraft. To, to move to another program, and that program uh, didn't come together because of problems with the uh, the booster not being powerful enough, so we had to go to another booster to uh, to take a spacecraft uh, that from a company that hadn't built a spacecraft before, so it was gaining weight and wasn't able to put itself and the lander into lunar orbit, so we had to make the lander even bigger. And that same uh, rocket for Ares 1 uh, was being used on Ares 5. So it just appeared as though we weren't able to get the crew up there with the existing rocket. Uh, so we continued to develop the Orion and sort of shelved the, uh, the heavy lift vehicle. And uh, without uh, an Orion going somewhere, there's no point in continuing the lander. So the program really fell apart. Excuse me. Just tell us if that's a call from the space station. <laughs> Make sure it's not collect. <laughs> I, you know, Colonel, Colonel Cunningham, you, you talked about uh, what you perceived to be excessive politicization at NASA and, and the challenges that presents. Uh, I was curious if you could elaborate on that and, and, and what steps could be taken to help NASA focus on, on what should be its core mission. I mentioned a little bit of the politics from outside of NASA that's increasingly, over the years, it's grown increasingly on NASA. And uh, it had a lot to do with controlling with what projects they went, went into and what they did not. But it also, in my opinion, from the outside looking at it, it's infected uh, the agency itself. People inside of NASA are, are just not as willing to speak their mind on, on things to get them done. And uh, uh, some of these programs that have, money's been spent on and money's been, been canceled and we tried a single stage to orbit one time, I think a billion dollars on that. So what's happened? is NASA has changed, in my opinion, they have become a much more risk-averse agency over the years. Uh, for example, uh, we all realize that until we launched the Webb Telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope is the greatest telescope we've ever had. Well, we're going to have uh, the use of the Hubble Space Telescope for at least another five years, it looks like. But that wouldn't have happened had we not had the last servicing mission that went up there to service it. And that mission originally was going to go up a couple of years earlier and was canceled by then administrator at the time because it said it was too risky and they canceled it because they had lost some people on, on Columbia. So it's a, it's a metal kind of thing. Back in Apollo, we lost a, a crew on Apollo 1. We had people that... We're just fortunate they're still alive from Apollo 13. But you have to have the will to keep going. Fortunately, we had another administrator that came on after that one, and that administrator took a look at it. It was worth the, worth the risk. They went back and had the last servicing mission, and we had the greatest telescope in history. So I don't know how to do this, but we, because our society seems to be moving more risk-averse. But we need to have an agency that understands you've got to pay your money, take your chances, and get out there and push the frontier. When it comes to priorities in NASA, 
uh, there are a host of exploration priorities that have been discussed, whether it is asteroid retrieval, whether it is going to the moon, whether it is going to Mars, whether it is going beyond. Uh, I, I would welcome the views of, of the witnesses on this panel as, as to what the top priorities of NASA should be, which, which of those product, projects yield the greatest benefits, what order should they be staged in, uh, and to what extent should the focus be on manned exploration versus robotic exploration? Well, I can't tell you what degree, and I'm not an expert and totally up on internal affairs at NASA anymore at all, but as I, as I watch it, I find that what NASA has been trying to do for, well, over the last couple of decades, they recognize that the public at large uh, is looking for a demand for going to the next frontier, which happens to be, it's Mars now. <clears throat> and so they've also attempted then to rationalize whatever they were working on as a step along that program. <clears throat> Some of the things that they've proposed uh, certainly will have scientific value to scientists. Will they help us on that program? I doubt it. And there are other ways of doing it. For example, you don't hear NASA really talking about returning to the moon now. I used to be uh, one of those that was not wild about uh, stopping at the moon in order to get back to Mars. But I began to realize that we have to have a facility that's going to pe pe keep people alive on Mars, and it's going to be a whole lot cheaper and easier to develop on the moon uh, than than the other way. So I, I just think we need to get back on a program that's going to have the moon as an intermediate step and only as it fits in to go to the next frontier, Mars. You know, I, 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 it's interesting because Buzz was talking about going to Mars and, and well, moon and Mars. And, and I, I left the astronaut office in this, this past July. And um, we used to talk about this for years. You know, where are we going next? You know, we're going to go beyond North Orbit. Where are we going to go? And you can make an argument, I think, for almost any one of them. But I think the thing that has in common is we need to go somewhere. And I do think that NASA does have a plan to take us away from low Earth orbit. We're working with the companies that have been selected to provide. We've already got cargo going to the, to the station. And now we're going to have astronauts flying to the station uh, with the commercial crew. Um, that's the plan. I think that seems like it's taking the right steps and going in the right direction. But the, the, uh, the opportunity, the ability to, to leave the planet, to leave our orbit, is common to all of those things. So I, I've been thinking about this. What would we pick the destination? Which one do we pick? Because there's so many arguments, right? Yeah, you're going to get different opinions from, I'll, you know, people change their mind in the same day when we talked about it, right? Oh, that's a good point. Maybe we don't exactly know exactly where we should go, but we know we want to go somewhere. If we can get the lift capability, the, or the Orion capsule ready to go. We had the test back in December, which was successful. They have a plan for another one in a couple of years. It's picked up a lot of momentum. A lot of my friends, I was working on when I was in the office, a lot of my friends are still working on those displays. People are spending money. They're, they're, they're building hardware to go. Whether that destination is to the asteroid, whether that, whether that destination is to the moon or Mars, I think we're probably going to get clear on that as we get a little bit further. Maybe we can go all the way to Mars. Maybe the propulsion research and technology we develop can get us there quicker. Maybe not. Maybe we can go to the moon. Maybe not. Maybe we can go to the asteroid. If that's the, the closest case, the one that's least cost that's going to keep us in a budget, maybe that's the right answer. But I think they are taking the right steps to get away from low Earth orbit. I think you can make a, a, an argument for each one of these. Maybe the idea is that we plan on leaving, take those steps now, and it might be clear to us where that destination is going to be a few years from now. Let me see if I can integrate these things together. In the 60s and 70s, we learned how to go and land on the moon and stay and do some things there. To do that again 50 years later just does not seem to be something that would be attractive to the in people involved or the people who were supporting this. We did not build permanent there. Other countries will build landers. While they are doing that, we can build the permanent structures, but those permanent structures will be the same ones in the same base design that we will do at the moon. In order to build those on the moon, we need uh, a, a fairly redundant facility on the near side and on the far side to robotically build those. 
We can design them with our concepts of a base, and we know that Europe has a company that built pressure vessels for the uh, space station, and they can get additional resources in South Korea and India, so they can build the modules that will uh, go to the moon. Based on our design, they need to be standard. And we have uneven terrain in a gravity field, so you pick one off of a lander and put it where you want it. Now another lander is over here. You pick this one up and bring it over. They won't line up. You've got to level them. You've got a difference in elevation. You've got to account for, account for that. This is too much for the students at Purdue. It will be done, but I'm going to another resource to help the, the students in Purdue to, uh, in their study to do that. But the habitats that will be based on what we want at Mars will then be exercised at the moon. Before we do that, we'll use the big island of Hawaii to make sure that the things all come together. We need an inflatable right away at Earth orbit, L1 and L2. We'll develop a rigid and we'll put it at those two places. Those rigids are what we construct things on and they're the ones that, uh, uh, that will be similar to what we're going to build and send to Mars with a build-up so that at the time our cycling system deposits the first people on Mars, the build-up will be complete. So, so we have something that's integrated. Now what can we do with that inflatable and, and Orion? Well, we could send it to an asteroid. And we can send a robot, year and a half mission, and the crew gets there in four months, two days before. But it's got 60 days at that asteroid with a scientist who knows about asteroids, a robotic scientist. That's a crew and a robot at the same asteroid in place. Now that's with the inflatable. When we get to the rigid, we can send Orion with the rigid on a round flyby of Venus. We can do that in a year. It takes a whole lot longer to do it at Mars. When we come back, we can uh, exercise aero capture maneuvers that need to be done uh, at, at Mars. So we'll be doing these things and we'll be landing. Different people will be building and landing and we'll be getting this, these habitats. The, the different habitats, nine, we'll take three of them and we condition it for it's the cycler. And we get it in its cycle, and then we use three landers for triple redundancy. And we, because all a lander has to do is to get on the cycler, cycler supplies it with everything it needs, it gets off and lands. And the facilities are, are there for them to take care of. And each pass that that outbound, we reuse the same facilities, so we don't have to build them again. And we can have an inbound cycler that can bring people back in emergencies. It's a plan that is built and integrated, evolving as we go along. Thank you very much, gentlemen.